everybody, I want to welcome you on this Sunday morning to New Hope Church Live. So glad that you could be with us. I would love it, man, if you would get into the comments on YouTube or Facebook and put in where you're watching from. Service is going to start in about 14 minutes. Glad you're here today. God bless. Church, good morning. It's so good to see you today. 
My name is Pastor Colin, one of the high school pastors on our student ministry team here, and I want to say right now, you are watching live from our iCampus studio at one of our physical locations. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you, to be honest, uh, is that it's going to feel very obvious. But right now, uh, in our world, we're walking through kind of a, a weird time and, and an uncertain time, a time that maybe even brings anxiety. But I'm more confident about the next thing that I'm going to tell you, and that thing is this is it right now God is doing some incredible things through His church. Uh, week in and week out, watching what's going on at New Hope Church. I think this iCampus uh, even is a testament to that, watching us reach people uh, locally, uh, nationally, and internationally as well. And so I'd invite you right now, let us know. Uh, where are you tuning in from today? Go ahead and put that in the comment section, whether you're watching from Facebook or YouTube. We would love to know uh, where you're tuning in from today. And the next thing is this, today, after service, we're gonna baptize a brand new brother in Christ. His name is Andrew. Uh, we're gonna walk out there and baptize him. And so I wanna, I wanna invite you now, church family, to say to Andrew in the comment section, congratulations uh, for going public in your faith today. Now, uh, Andrew, I wanna say this to you now. Uh, we're excited for you, and we cannot wait to see the things that God is gonna do through you uh, and in your life. The beginning today, brother, we're so excited for you. Now, the next thing is this, NA students, tonight, students, those of you who are watching with us right now, seven o'clock, 10 minutes early, 6.50. We're open in the lobby for you and we cannot wait to see you there for our first ever live service. Super proud of our team. I've been praying over this event, working on this event for a few weeks now and we cannot wait to see the incredible things that God is gonna do. They're our first ever online live service tonight, seven o'clock on our NH Students YouTube page. Students, cannot wait to see you there. Just a few minutes, uh, we're gonna begin a uh, time of worship together, uh, and we can't wait to see you guys then. Again, so glad you're here.
everybody. I again want to welcome you to New Hope Church, no matter who you are, no matter where you're watching from. And uh, as we have said and will continue to say, please let us know where you're watching from in the comments today. It just helps us to know who we're reaching, but it's also a huge encouragement to those who are in the service as well. Hopefully during the uh, edge of the hurricane, you stayed high and dry. I know I even got uh, rained on today on my way to church, but uh, God is good. And it's just like one of those things we've been talking about with murder hornets. You never know what's coming next, but God is good. Now I want you to do this. If you're watching this on your TV or you have surround sound or something, I want you to turn it up and turn it up because we're going to worship together because no matter what happens, God is good. Somebody say amen. Let's worship together. Let's get ready to worship. Let's get ready to sing in response to the great things our God has done. Let's declare this truth together. Come on, we sing.
to show his faithfulness and that's why we respond through singing through praise because he is worthy we know that our God is faithful and he's walking with us through this time and he's going to see us through to a victory because he loves us and I feel like somebody needs to hear that today that Jesus loves you he gave it all for you so that way you could be free and to celebrate that freedom here today Let's go before our God in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this day. God, for the opportunity that you've placed before us, God, to celebrate the truth, the freedom that we have in Jesus, the hope that we find in Jesus, God. God, as we continue to walk through life, God, we pray that we draw near to you and seek you 
in our times of trouble, God. We thank you, Father, and we love you. It's in your son's powerful name that we pray this together. And everyone said at home, come on, amen. Let's continue to sing out about his faithfulness.
upon his foundation today. Come on, every voice lift it up. Well, good morning, New Hope Church. So glad that you are here with us today. My name is Colin Hopkins, and I'm one of our student pastors here on our New Hope Church team. And I want to say, if this is your first time joining with us online, good morning. We're so glad that you're here. Today, we can begin that conversation of what it looks like to learn more about New Hope and how to become more involved here. And it starts with a simple text. Text the word FIRST to the number 642 We'd love to begin that conversation with you today. Now today, we're going to continue a series that we started last week called Murder Hornets. Now a great way to follow along in the sermon today is text in the letters LG to that same number, 642-123. On there, you're going to see verses and points, things you can write down, save to your phone, a great way to remember the sermon from today. Now, one thing we like to say every single week here at New Hope is for those of you who tithe, offer, and faithfully give is thank you. We cannot do church the way that we do it without you and opening up this area of your life and saying yes, especially right now in a time where we may look and say it's uncertain, um, uh, maybe even uncomfortable, and you continually say yes to the Lord, and we watch the Lord do great things through our finances here at New Hope. And so we want to say again, thank you. Now, there's some great things going on in New Hope that we would love to connect you with today. Uh, and today uh, is actually one of those is concluding. It's our NH Students Micro Mission, serving our frontline workers. What we did is we partnered up with some local doctor's offices and hospitals near all of our physical locations. Uh, we collecting items uh, so that we can put them in a New Hope bag, give them some information about our church, and even invite them to an online service. So today, on our website, click on the Events tab. Find out what you can drop off and where you can drop it off at, because tonight that micro mission closes, and we'd love for you to partner with us this week as we love our neighbor well. Now, there's another incredible thing going on tonight, and it's our NH Students online service. Today, for the first time ever, our team is going live at 7 o'clock, 10 minutes before that, 6.50. The lobby opens up for comments so that we can interact with our students. Um, But what's going on tonight in our live service, we're going to have live teaching live games, live challenges, live worship. We're going to pray over our nation together. And so students that are watching right now, I cannot wait to see you at 650 as we open our first ever live service. Another incredible thing with another awesome ministry at New Hope is our NH Kids Summer Serve Micro Mission. 
Today, uh, we're partnering with an awesome organization called NH Kids Kids Meal, or excuse me, Kids Meals Houston. And what they do is they partner uh, with poverty-stricken um, uh, young kids in our city, and they're bringing them a meal delivery service. And right here, I actually have what, what, how you can help. It's just like this right here. And so what we're asking our church family to do uh, is draw on, color, write encouraging scriptures and encouraging words um, to our neighbors in Houston. Again, we're collecting these items at the 288 campus, the Friendswood campus, on August 2nd, 1 to 2 p.m. So this is a great way that you can love your neighbor well in Houston starting today. Now, incredible news that I want to share with you today. Uh, we have a, a special um, guest today that we're hearing from, and his name is Pastor John Davis. Right now, he's the lead pastor at Providence Church. Now, maybe you're a little bit newer uh, to the New Hope family. You may not know this about Pastor John, but he served on our team for 12 years. He helped spearhead life groups, helped spearhead missions. He taught classes, uh, helped organize classes at our church. And for all intents and purposes, he was our first ever campus pastor when we opened up our Friendswood campus. No doubt, an incredible man of God. And I think when we look at New Hope today, we are in part where we are today in part of the way that Pastor John loved our church, loved our mission, and served our church. And so, Pastor John, thank you so much for the way that you loved our mission and loved on New Hope Church. We cannot wait to hear from you today as you speak to our church. Several years ago, um, Pastor John felt a calling on his life to go back to the church where he was previously the youth pastor, Providence Church, and uh, we begged him at New Hope to stay. But he was so confident in God's calling on his life. He said yes to the Lord, and he's been faithfully leading that church for several years now, and he is doing a great work there. And so, Pastor John, our church is ready uh, to hear you speak a great word to us today. And so, church, would you right now, in the comment section, welcome Pastor John to New Hope Church as he shares a great word with us today as we go into week two of Murder Hornets. Church, we're so glad you're here. Well, I want to welcome you to New Hope Church. We are so glad that you've made the decision to tune in with us this morning. My name is John. I'm actually the pastor of Providence Church in Sugarland. And let me just say right up front, it is an honor for me to be back with you. Now, some of you might remember this, but there was a time when I was on staff here at New Hope. And I'm so thankful for those years because Pastor Tim influenced me more than he could ever know. In fact, oftentimes when I'm trying to make a decision at at my church, one of the questions that I will ask myself is what would Pastor Tim do? You, you know, if Pastor Tim were here, what would he do if he were in my shoes? And that question has served me well. And so as a church family, you just need to know how blessed you are to have a pastor who loves God, who loves leading you, and who loves investing in leaders like me. So would you do me a favor, put your hands together and show some love for Pastor Tim this morning. Well, if you're just joining us, we are in week two of a lesson series called Murder Hornets. And the reason we're doing this series is because the year 2020 has been one crazy year. Starting back in March, it seems like we've been dealing with one thing right after the other. And as a result, many of us are feeling overwhelmed. Many of us are feeling uncertain. Many of us are fear, feeling fearful about the future. But praise the Lord, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Instead, God has given us a spirit of love, power, and self-discipline. And so with his help, we can learn how to thrive even when life is uncertain. Now, the foundation for this series comes from three powerful chapters found in God's Word. Those chapters would be 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5. Today, we are going to be in chapter 5. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to turn them open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 1. But while you are turning there, I want to share a quick story with you. Uh, several years ago, I actually took a trip to Costa Rica. And if you ever get the chance to go, I'm going to encourage you to do so because it's a beautiful country with lots of beautiful people. What I did not realize is that I had planned my trip 
during the rainy season. And so every day, because it was the rainy season, around noon, clouds would begin to form in the sky. And then about five or six o'clock at night, it would start to gently rain. But it wasn't that big of a deal because every single morning when I would wake up, the clouds would be gone, the sun would be shining, and it would be a perfect blue sky day. Now, it, it did this every single day. Every single day I was there, same weather pattern. That is until the night I was supposed to leave. The night I was supposed to leave, it started raining, I don't know, around five or six o'clock in the evening, but it wasn't the gentle rain that we'd been getting all week long. Instead, it started raining hard. In fact, it rained all night long. And so when I got up to leave the hotel, they actually called a taxi for me so that I could get to the airport. Now, the airport was a little ways out of town. And so we had to drive out to the terminal. But when we got to the entrance to the airport, there was a problem. The, the, the entrance to the airport actually had a gate and there was a man standing at the gate with a uniform on. Now, to make matters worse, I don't speak Spanish. The taxi driver did not speak English. And so I listened while those two guys talked, but then he turned around and using hand gestures, you know, he tried to explain to me that uh, because of the rains, the rains washed the road away. And so we were going to have to drive to a different airport. At least that's what I, I think he said. And so I said, all right, let's do this. And so we started heading down the main highway there in the town I was in. And after a couple of miles, we turned off the main road onto a side street that went through several neighborhoods or several little villages. Eventually, we got to another road. We turned onto it. It was like this really bad old country road that was heading out into the middle of nowhere. And I'll be honest with you, as we're heading out into the middle of nowhere, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. The reason I'm getting nervous is because there are no houses, there are no homes anywhere. And when the taxi cab did come to a stop, it did so next to a fence that was wrapped in caution tape. And so at that moment, you know, when I saw the caution tape, my, my panic meter started to go and I started thinking about what I was going to do if something went down. You know, which way was I going to run just in case something went down? Well, fortunately, I didn't have to run away nothing bad happened. Instead, the taxi cab driver got out of the vehicle, walked around to the rear of the car, opened the trunk, pulled my bags out, set them on the ground, pointed at something that looked like an airfield to me, and then he held his hand out and asked to be paid. And after I paid the man, I watched as he got back into the taxi cab and drove off, leaving me standing in the middle of nowhere all by myself. Now, in that moment, as I'm standing by myself in the middle of nowhere, all I could think was, I'm not really certain I'm ever going to get home again. I wasn't even certain I could find my way back to the hotel. Now, I've decided to title today's lesson, Certain Uncertainty. And I actually like this title for a couple of reasons. First, I like this title because the only thing certain about this life is that this life is going to be uncertain. That's the only thing certain about this life. I mean, think about it. Life is unpredictable. Life is constantly changing. One minute you think you got life all figured out. The next minute you don't know where you are or what's going on. And so the only certainty in this life is that this life will be uncertain. But I also like this title for another reason. I like it because if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you put your hope in this book, then you can find certainty no matter how uncertain things may be. Now, last week we learned that to live with certainty, we must know who God is. And if you missed last week's message, you got to go back and listen to it. It was powerful. But this week I'm going to introduce a new thought to you. I want you to know that we can live with certainty or in order to live with certainty, we're going to have to know where we are going. To, to live with certainty, we're going to have to know where we are going. And so to do so, I'm going to give you three thoughts about the afterlife to help us to live with certainty in the here and now. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This would be point number one, to live with certainty. I must realize life 
is temporary. To live with certainty, I must realize that life is temporary. Now, real quick, I need to give you some context for 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians is actually a letter written by the apostle Paul, who was perhaps the greatest evangelist this world has ever known. The reason I say that is because over a 20-year period, Paul planted churches in at least 40 different cities throughout modern-day Turkey, Greece, and Italy. Of course, one of those churches that Paul planted was the church in Corinth. However, because Paul was constantly on the move, he only stayed in Corinth for about one year and six months before leaving and going to the next city so that he could plant another church. But was, as was his practice, Paul would often revisit these churches, and if there were ever any issues, then he would write a letter to them. Well, 2 Corinthians is a letter that's written to the believers in Corinth. Now, something I find interesting is that Paul never wanted to be a financial burden to any church that he served. And so he served as a bivocational pastor, meaning even though his main gig was making disciples, Paul had a side job to pay the bills. And his side hustle was making tents, which is going to make this next verse make a lot of sense. Let's pick up 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes this, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, then we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now let me stop right there for just one moment. Something you need to know about the first century church in Corinth is that things were not that much different for them than they are for us today. Let me explain. There were political battles back then, just like today. There was sickness and disease. In fact, many of the population had to be quarantined. Does that sound familiar to anybody? There were also racial and religious tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. And financially speaking, there was a great divide between the haves and the have-nots. Well, this caused many people in Corinth to feel uncertain about the future. And Paul recognized this. And so one day while he's at work, you know, while he's sitting at at work, stitching tent pieces together, doing whatever tent makers do, as he's sitting at work, he begins to compare our present life on earth with our future life in heaven. And the conclusion that Paul came up with in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, is that living on this earth is a lot like living in one of these. Now, by show of hands, how many of you would admit that you enjoy tent camping? You love it. You love getting out in the country. You love tent camping. Okay, hands going up here, there, and everywhere. How about this? How many of you wouldn't go tent camping if it was the last place to vacation on earth? Okay, now there we go. We've got hands going up everywhere. Well, as I was preparing for this message, I actually read an article that described 26 different architectural styles of homes. I I didn't even know that you could build 26 different styles of homes. And I'm I'm not going to list all 26 to you, but let me share some of them that maybe you've heard of. There are modern homes, Victorian homes, ranch style homes. I think the Brady Bunch might have lived in one of those. There are town homes, log homes, and thanks to Chip and Joanna Gaines from the Magnolia Silos, there's something called farmhouse chic homes, okay? I've never even, never even heard of those, but, but the list goes on and on. However, if you read through the list, do you know what style is not mentioned on the list? You know what style of house is not mentioned on the list? Tents, Tents are not mentioned on the list. And you know why? Because tents were never designed to be a permanent dwelling. Okay, tents weren't designed to be permanent. I mean, think about it. There's no kitchen in a tent. There's no bathroom in a tent. There's no closet in a tent. I I mean, nothing that you would need today you can find in a tent. And so as Paul sat at his job and as he thought about the Corinthian church, he realized that tents might be great for camping, but tents make terrible home which is why Paul wrote what he did next. Let's go ahead and pick up in verse two. It says this, meanwhile, we groan. Everybody say groan. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling because when we are clothed, we will not be found 
naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, I know that there's a lot going on there in that passage, but here's what you need to know. Paul is comparing and contrasting our current life on earth with our future home in heaven. And in this passage, Paul uses one word two times to describe how many of us feel while we live on this earth. Paul used one word two times, and that was the word groan. So what, what in the world is Paul talking about? Well, the word groan, it means to sigh or to grieve. In, in other words, Paul is making the observation that deep down inside, all of us know that there's got to be more to this life than what we can see with our own eyes. Paul's making the observation that, that all of us deep down inside our souls, we know that we have been made for more than this. And because we know that something is missing, because we know that we've been made for more, and we groan. Now, now people may groan differently, okay? All of us groan a little bit differently. For example, some of us may groan physically. You, you know what I'm talking about? Some, some of you know what I'm talking about. As we get older, we can't help but notice it takes a little more effort to get ourselves up and get ourselves going out the door. I mean, we may grunt, we may groan a little bit more in the morning than we used to. Others of us, we don't groan physically. Instead, we groan emotionally. And some of you know what I'm talking about because as we watch the news or as we scroll through our social media feeds, we can't help but be saddened by what we see in the world around us. But then there's a whole nother group who are groaning. They're, they're, they're groaning spiritually. You see, there's a group that as they grow closer to God, as they mature, they find themselves looking forward more and more to the day when they can go home and be with God. And that's exactly where Paul was. In fact, that's exactly where Paul wants us to be. You see, Paul understood that someday our temporary groaning is going to be replaced by eternal glory. So, so someday we will no longer have to live in an uncomfortable, stinky tent. Instead, we are going to live in a beautiful home where God is is. And Paul's not sad about it. In fact, he's pretty excited about it. That's because Paul understood that even though we groan now, even though, even though we are burdened now by things like the coronavirus or job loss or homeschooling the kids or, or, or tropical storms in the Gulf or even murder hornets, no matter what we might face in the year 2020, it will not last. And so anytime you begin to feel uncertain, anytime you start to groan, Paul would say that is to be a reminder not to focus on what is temporary. Instead, that's your cue to fix your eyes on what is eternal because what's eternal is gonna be way better than anything we could experience here on this earth. It's like the difference between living in a tent and a home, which leads us to the second point, to live with certainty, I must accept God's guarantee. To live with certainty, I must accept God's guarantee. Go ahead and take a look at what Paul writes next. This is 2 Corinthians chapter five, starting with verse five. Paul writes this, now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a Deposit. Now, I want you to go ahead and circle that word spirit because I'm going to come back to it in just a minute. God has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Therefore, we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident and say we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, what was the word that I had you circle just a minute ago? It was, it was the word spirit, right? Now, anytime we start talking about the Holy Spirit, people get a little bit nervous. I mean, God the Father, we understand. God the Son, we understand. God the Spirit is a little bit more difficult for us to understand. But here's what you need to know. Paul says the Spirit is given to us by God as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 
So, so what in the world does that mean? Well, according to the text, God made us with one purpose in mind. God made us so that we could have a relationship with him. And because he loved us, he did all the hard work. He sent his son Jesus to this earth to do what we could not do for ourselves. And when we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, scripture says that God sends his spirit to live in us. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to guarantee our spot in heaven. The the best part is the Holy Spirit is a guarantee that never goes bad and can never be denied. Now, I was thinking about a way to illustrate this point, and I started thinking about tickets. Okay, recently, I had four tickets to the rodeo, but these weren't just any old, everyday, ordinary tickets. These were tickets to see Chris Stapleton. Are there any Chris Stapleton fans in the house today? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, what you need to know is that my wife loves country music. I mean, Irene loves country music. And because I love Irene, every now and then I will listen to country music. That said, I'm not typically much of a country music fan, but I do like me some Chris Stapleton, okay? I mean, that man can sing. I I like all of his songs. I like the song Parachute. That's pretty good. I like the song Millionaire. That's, that's pretty good. I, I like this other song. I'm going to sing it for you right now. In fact, you could sing along, but here, here it goes. Seen my share of broken halos. Yeah, that's good. You know it. I like that. I like that. I, li- I just like, I like all of his music. So I'm really excited about going to this concert. Plus it's the rodeo. They got, they got funnel cake at the rodeo and Irene looks so good in boots. So, so I'm really fired up about going to this concert. Sadly, A few days before the concert took place, the city of Houston shut down the rodeo. Now, I completely understand why they did it. I mean, we got to keep people safe, right? Unfortunately for me, though, even though I had four tickets, I had no guarantee to see the show. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Even though I have four tickets with seat numbers and everything, tickets that I paid money for, I had no guarantee that I was going to be able to see the show. So what in the world does Chris Stapleton and the rodeo have to do with you and I and God and the Holy Spirit? Well, here's what you need to know. You need to know that our God is a promise-keeping God. And even though following Jesus is no guarantee that life will be easy or that the kids are never going to make any bad decisions or that the company that you start is always going to be successful. When God makes a promise to you, you better believe that he is going to keep that promise. And when he gives you his spirit, it comes with some powerful, powerful guarantees. In fact, let me give you some of the promise that we find in God's word that has to do with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, God guarantees that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, God guarantees that he will give you peace even in the middle of a pandemic. When the Spirit of God lives in you, God guarantees that he will work all things together for your good and for his glory. When the Spirit of God lives in you, God guarantees he's going to equip you for every good purpose. I hope that you're getting excited right now because I think I'm preaching better than you're listening right now. When, When the Spirit of God is in you, we have God's guarantee that he is going to transform us more and more into his image. When the Spirit of God lives in us, we have God's guarantee that he will be our rock and our fortress and that we will never be shaken. But one of the greatest guarantees that God gives us has to do with the fact that anyone who has the spirit of God living in them is going to spend all of eternity with him. And that that is so important for us to understand today. That is so important for us to get today. The, The reasons I say that is because oftentimes I'll have somebody ask me, you know, every once in a while I'll have somebody come to me and ask me spiritual questions. One of the questions I get would be this one. Pastor, pastor, is it possible to lose your salvation? 
And, and usually what they mean by that is they did, they did something last weekend that they, that they regret and they're wondering if God's grace is going to be sufficient for them. And so I don't know if you're out there, maybe you've ever had this question or thought this question. Maybe you're thinking this question right now. I don't, I don't know. But I always say the same thing. When I get asked that question, I always say the same thing. I say the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that nothing can separate you from his love. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, as long as I confess him as Lord, when God looks at me, he says, that's my child and I got your spot reserved in heaven. Of course, the question that all of us have to answer is, have we accepted God's guarantee? You see, God will never force himself on anyone but he wants everyone to be a part of his family. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. God says, if you will receive my free gift of salvation, I will fill you with my spirit. And that will be my guarantee that you're gonna be with me for all of eternity. Well, we gotta keep moving to number three, to live with certainty. I must live for the future embrace. To live with certainty, I must live for the future embrace. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter five. We're gonna pick up in verses nine and 10. It says this, so we make it our goal to read these next two words out loud with me, for we make it our goal to please him, whether we at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. My youngest son, Griffin, actually attends college in Atlanta, Georgia. And so uh, back, in, back in March, we received uh, an email from Kennesaw State University letting us know that Griffin had like less than one week to pack up all of his stuff in the dorm and get it moved out of there. And so uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I decided to uh, jump in the Suburban, you know, jump in my truck and head all the way to Atlanta in order to pick up his stuff. In fact, I've got a a picture of Griffin's room right here. Uh, some of, some of you don't recognize that guy in the picture, do you? I mean, he was a lot smaller the last time you saw him, but that, that's Griffin. That's his dorm room right there. But as you can see, there's not really a whole lot of stuff in, in his, in his dorm. He didn't really have that much stuff. But when I got there, Griffin kept telling me that he didn't think my vehicle was going to be big enough. You know, he didn't think the Suburban was big enough to hold all of his stuff. So I told him, I said, listen, one way or the other, we're going to make it all fit. I mean, if I have to tie some things down on the roof of the Suburban, like the Beverly Hillbillies, that's what we're going to do, because I'm only making one trip up here and one trip back home. Well, the funny part is, is you know, when we finally started loading up Griffin's stuff, uh, he wouldn't let me help him pack. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't want me touching anything, which was probably a good idea because I would have just tossed his stuff into a plastic bag and thrown it in the back of the Suburban so I could hit the road. You know, that's how I would have done it. But he didn't want me to do it that way. He wanted to carefully pack everything into organized boxes so nothing would get damaged. Now, now listen, as a parent, I'm so glad that Griffin wants to take care of his things. We've raised our kids to respect their property and other people's property. We think that that's a good thing. I mean, I mean, it totally beats the alternative, right? If he was just throwing stuff everywhere and didn't really care. So, so as a parent, I'm glad that he wants to take care of his things. But as we drove down I-10, you know, as we headed back to the Houston area, it dawned on me that all of Griffin's most prized possessions were now in the back of my truck. I, I mean, how many, how many of you remember when all of your most prized possessions could fit in one vehicle? Anybody remember those days? Think, things were a lot simpler then, right? I mean, a lot less complicated then, right? Well, well, everything that Griffin values most, you know, his clothes, his wakeboard, his computer, his TV, his school books, at least I hope he values his school books. Everything that he owns in his life was in the back of my truck. Now, again, as a parent, I'm glad that he wants to take care of his things, but as the spiritual leader of the household, my hope is, my prayer is that he understands that in the grand scheme of things, in God's economy, that none of that stuff that he owns, none of those possessions are anything that really matter in this life. 
Instead, what really matters is that if he would live for things that are going to last for all eternity. That's, that's exactly why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, that's exactly why he wrote, so, so we make it our goal to do what? To live our lives to please him. You see, Paul understood that one day we're all gonna stand before Jesus. And on that day, we're gonna have to give an account for the way that we spent our time and the way that we used our resources here on this earth. And the big question that all of us are going to have to answer in that moment is, did I live my life to please God or did I live my life to please me? Did did I truly make an impact in this world for the kingdom? Or did I simply collect a bunch of stuff and a bunch of memories and experiences that won't matter once I'm gone? You know, the the reality is all of us are trying to please so many people in our lives. I mean, if you're married, you're trying to please your spouse. If you're in school, you're trying to please your teacher. If you're an employer, you're trying to please your employees. If you're an employee, you're trying to please the boss. Right now, all of us are trying to please our city officials, right? By wearing masks and social distancing and all these things. But listen to me, the only person that it really matters that I please is the one who created me and gave his life for me. And my greatest desire And I hope it's your greatest desire as well. But my greatest desire is to stand before Jesus someday and for him to put his arm around me and for him to say these words to me, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were living for the future embrace. So how in the world do we live our lives to please God? How do we live our lives to please God and, 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 and live for that future embrace? Well, it's really very simple. If you wanna please God, then you just need to live your life to love others. If you, want, if you want to please God, all you got to do is serve others. Notice Jesus did not say, well done, good and faithful church attender. That's not what he said. Well done, good and faithful praise singer. Well done, good and faithful Bible college student. Jesus didn't say any of those things. What did Jesus say? He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I got to tell you something right now, that, that, that this is the best time for us to be serving those around us. This is not the time for the church to back up. This is not the time for the church to hoard and to be afraid. This is the time for the church to be looking to meet needs because there are people that are hurting all around us. There are people that need to be served all around us. And even if you don't have anything to give physically, you've got something to give spiritually. There are people out there that need a word of encouragement. There are people out there who need prayer. Of course, there are physical things that people need as well. And if God blesses you with those things, then you should serve people with those things. And if you're not certain how you can do that, how you can live to, to please God, how you can live to serve others, let me tell you something. All you have to do is ask God. Just ask God to show you one person this week who you can serve. And I can promise you that God is going to put a name, going to put a person, going to put a family in your path that you can serve. And then what you need to do is you need to take what God has given to you and you need to use it to serve them. How do we live with certainty in uncertain times? Well, we realize that life is temporary. We accept God's guarantee and we live for the future embrace. This time I want to close out our service by doing a couple of things. First thing I wanna do is give you a chance to respond to Jesus. And then I wanna pray for you. I know that there are so many people in our world who are feeling uncertain right now. And maybe you're one of them. Maybe what you need 
more than ever before is to simply hold on to the certainty of God. You you need to recognize that this life is temporary and put your trust in the one who is eternal. I know that God's one purpose for your life is that you would have a relationship with him. I know that he loves you and that he cares about you and wants nothing more than for you to accept his free gift of salvation. If you're ready to make that decision today, I want you to text prayer to 642-123. Just text prayer. Somebody will get in touch with you. They're gonna lead you through that decision today. Also, if you just need prayer for any reason, you can do so on our website or you can do so by texting prayer. But we've got prayer partners who wanna pray for you and lift you up. And so uh, this time I do wanna pray for you myself. Let's go ahead and bow together and we will be dismissed. Dear God, we come to you in the powerful name of Jesus. Right now, there are people all over the globe who are uncertain about the future. Right now, there are people who are unsure about what tomorrow may bring. So God, I pray that all fear would be replaced by peace. God, I pray that uncertainty would be replaced by the knowledge that you are working all things together for your glory and for our good. God, we praise you for loving us. We praise you that you have something better planned for us in the future. And I pray that as we leave this place, that we would live with confidence, that we would live boldly for you. And more importantly, that we would long for that future embrace. It's the name of Jesus that I pray and ask all of these things. Amen. Pastor John, thank you so much for that encouraging uh, and challenging message. Uh, we're, we're glad to receive it as a church family today. Now, church, I've uh, been super excited about this. Today, uh, we get to celebrate together as we baptize our brother, Andrew. And what Andrew is doing is going public in his faith by believing that God the Father sent his son Jesus uh, to die for his people, raise again, um, and making a way for us to enjoy eternal life with him. Uh, And so we're so excited. And so would you now, church family, in the comment section below, uh, cheer on our brother Andrew before we baptize him. Uh, Right now, we're going to go ahead and pray over him, and then we're going to go ahead and get into the water. Andrew, let's go ahead and pray for you, brother. Jesus, uh, we're so excited um, to baptize our brother Andrew today as as he goes public uh, with his faith, um, believing um, that you came and you lived perfectly, uh, you died, and you rose again, uh, all making a way uh, for us to enjoy eternal life with you. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Amen. All right, brother, let's go ahead and get into the water. That is fantastic. Uh, So glad you've all joined us today. Thankful for Andrew and his faith. Uh, Just a little side note here. He's an ER doctor. So he's been on the front lines of this thing. So we need to be praying for people like him who've uh, been fighting this battle for us. And God bless him. God bless his family, his girls. And um, pray that you all remain safe. Uh, Watch out for each other. Uh, Call somebody or be around somebody or, or check on somebody this week that may be struggling with loneliness or whatever, but uh, glad you've been with us today. Uh, Hopefully you can join us on Tuesday morning, uh, 8 a.m. for our TNT devotional. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye.